for today in our 150th regular period of sessions. Itself quite historic. Um, sorry to bring you out on this awful, in awful weather, but we don't have much control over that. Uh, this morning, we our hearing is going to be uh, about the uh, case Henry Hill et al from the United States. Uh, we have with us representatives from the state, uh, Lawrence Gumbina, Rachel Owen, Margaret Pickering, and Sabina Rajpal. And with us, we have with us the participants, petitioners, uh, Stephen Watt, Deborah LaBelle, uh, Congressman, well, we hope will join us, uh, and Fred Mester. On my right, I have a uh, former president of the court, Commissioner Felipe Gonzalez, and our new commissioner, Paolo Vanucci. And we are going to be a little different today because of the fact that it's a case and the petitioners have asked us for 25 minutes instead of the usual 20 minutes. And we have agreed. Uh, but of course, that means that we will also give the state 25 minutes if they need it. Uh, if they don't need it 25 minutes, then we have more time to ask questions. But if you do, we have spoken amongst ourselves and we will try to keep our remarks you know, to the absolute minimum so that we can still finish on time. So without further ado, let's start because it's already a little late because of the weather. So we'll ask the petitioners to start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the petitioners, um, my name is Deborah LaBelle, and I'm here on behalf of children who were sentenced to life without parole in Michigan. Um, we wish to thank the commission for the opportunity to address this grave human rights violation, a violation that has resulted in 364 children in Michigan and 2,500 children nationally being punished without regard to their special status as a child, without regard to their best interests, or without any concern for their rehabilitation. Um, in support of this petition, 11 organizations, including the NAACP, LDF, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and Campaign for Sentencing, Fair Sentencing of Youth have submitted rather extensive written amicus testimony in support of the petitioners at this hearing. In addition, we are honored and hope to have uh, United States Congressman John Conyers, who has had some difficulty with some votes on the Hill, um, join us, retired Michigan Judge Fred Mester, um, and um, myself speaking. Respectful of the Commissioner's time, um, Congressman Conyers, Judge Mester, and myself will testify for six minutes each, and we will conclude with a three-minute video in which we present the um, testimony of one youth, um, a 16-year-old who was sentenced less than a year ago in Michigan after the Miller decision to life without possibility of parole, and a petitioner who has served almost 20 years in adult prison without any review in Michigan. I want to note that Henry Hill, the named petitioner, um, has been in prison since the age of 16. He is now 48 years old. Um, he has never been reviewed for release. He has never been assessed, and despite the fact that um, many corrections officials testified to him as being rehabilitated many, many years ago, he has no opportunity for release at this time in Michigan. He was imposed a sentence of life without possibility of parole, a sentence that has universal condemnation in this world. It's not just prohibited by the laws, treaties, and international standards, but is embedded in the fundamental um, values of all other nations. And by its um, customary laws and practice, it has reached jus cogent status. Um, as we have stated in our petition, only the United States continues to allow this sentence to be imposed. The sentence itself is a grave human rights violation, but what is happening to youth goes beyond the sentence. The, at the very beginning, in all phases of the criminal justice system, in Michigan and elsewhere, the status of the child is simply denied. The child is treated as an adult when they are charged. It is treated as an adult when it's before the judge. It is treated as an adult when it's sentenced, and is treated as an adult when it's placed in adult prisons at the age of 14 and up in Michigan. 
Um, there is no consideration of special protections or the child's best interests. In fact, because of their status as life without parole, they are denied participation in rehabilitative programs as the state of Michigan states that they will never be released, so there is no point in looking at programming, education, or treatment. Um, the, many of the youth, as a result of that, far from getting special protections, the petitioners, including Henry Hill, suffered sexual assaults after being placed in an adult prison at the age of 16 without any special protection. They've been subject to long periods in isolation and solitary confinement and deprived of food, medical, psychological, and educational programs and treatment appropriate to their age. 90% of the petitioners testified to us that they believe that one of the salient memories of them being in prison as a child was that they were hungry on a day-to-day -day basis because the caloric um, intake for children at that, that they give to people in prison is based on being 33 years old, not on being 15 and 16-year-old boys. And the practice um, is also have the disparities, of racial disparities and underpinnings of this sentence create additional violations. In Michigan, it goes beyond the fact that 72% of the youth are youth of color that receive this sentence in a state which has a population of 15% children of color. But more crucial, 85% of those youth who did not commit a homicide are youth of color, 85%. The, I counted up the human rights violations implicated in the state of Michigan's mistreatment of Henry Hill and the petitioners. And if you look at the American Declaration, the CRC, the American Convention, the CRC, CERD, ICCPR, there are 45 articles that are being violated by these treatment of children. While we have not received the U.S. brief based on recent statements in Geneva and prior statements in this case, we expect them to state that this matter is resolved by the Supreme Court's decision in Miller and that um, they are, have no control over the states. While we applaud the recent rulings of the U.S. Supreme Court um, that recognize that children are different despite this core recognition that have led the rest of the world to prohibit the LWAP sentence, the United States continues to allow this punishment as evidenced, as you will see, by Michigan in which, after Miller, four youth have been sentenced to life without possibility of parole. Nor has the um, State Department taken adequate steps to ensure that the thousands of youth who did not have their status taken into account have an opportunity to release. It is not resolved, and the U.S. is not taking sufficient steps. Last year, over 60 NGOs submitted a letter to the United States Attorney General Eric Holder reporting that there are approximately three dozen individuals still in the federal system serving life without parole for crimes committed as a youth. The letter expressed concern that the federal sentencing guidelines still allow youth to receive LWAP sentences without consideration of this useful status. This mirrors the fact that 37 states still have youth for whom Miller is not retroactive and the life without parole sentence is still allowed to be imposed. I would just note one further thing, that in addition, Michigan has um, passed legislation as there is no guidance as to what type of sentences you have if you don't give life without parole. And what faces the petitioners in Michigan and elsewhere is long indeterminate or de facto life sentence. In Michigan, they have said that in the future, if you, you can give life without parole or you can give a child without consideration their child status um, a minimum a minimum of 25 years. That is the minimum time they must serve before they're reviewed for release. And as this commission noted in Mendoza versus Argentina, where the commission found a sentence that did not allow review until 20 years to be a violation of the declaration, clearly a sentence of 25 years without any consideration their special status and placement in an adult prison um, must be a violation. I will turn at this time, I see that um, Congressman Conyers has been able to join us, and I'm honored to have him with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And top of the morning to all the commissioners and panelists and interested participants. This is a, a very important uh, part of the uh, criminal justice process 
that is unknown to most people. And I see it as uh, my responsibility and um, the two lawyers on Judiciary Committee, one who is leaving to go back as a public defender and the other who has taken leave as another public defender to, join, to replace her, Attorney Ashley McDonald and Attorney Vanessa Shin, uh, who have uh, helped us weather the uh, elements to get here and to uh, join all of you. And I appreciate the, the part of your testimony uh, that I heard. I, I want to work with you. And I, I want to describe how I uh, see the, the uh, congressional legislative uh, responsibility in this area. Because I think that this, one of the big challenges is that that we've got to get this information out of what happens to young people who are regularly sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. It is virtually unknown uh, among our citizenry because there's been so little attention paid to it. And so I, uh, as the former chairman of the House Judiciary Committee and now its ranking member, I see a very big responsibility to uh, get the word out. And uh, uh, I would be welcoming, and so would uh, my lawyers, uh, any uh, suggestions or recommendations that, that we may pursue. Now, it's my understanding that uh, there are only uh, 38 uh, people in this situation in the federal system, but uh, there are many, well, I think there are several thousand total, but uh, unless we began to examine, and th this is the heart of my remarks, is what do we do about it? Most of this is a state court uh, uh, inflicted uh, dis determinations. And so, uh, and, and uh, you only mentioned uh, Michigan six times while I was in the room. <laughs> Uh, and I know uh, it may be why I was invited to even participate because uh, the, there's such a big problem in my own state. And uh, we understand that there may not be a federal nexus uh, directly, but that this is, this is more a, a state matter. And uh, I'm thinking of... Uh, all the state legislators that I know, and and uh, the, this may be something that miraculously somebody in Congress can bipartisanize, bipartisanize this, so that we can uh, uh, begin to move forward on it. And I, I think that there may be some hope uh, uh, in. In this uh, in this process, uh, I I think that uh, there will be greater concern when I think of the uh, the bar organizations, the civil rights organizations, the criminal justice groups, uh, and a lot of other nonprofit organizations that may not be legally uh, involved that we should be able uh, to move forward on this. We are the only country that still regularly sentences young children to life without the possibility of parole. And uh, they're left to die behind bars. 
And one of one of the the things that are so important is that we can uh, uh, save money. My, many of my conservative friends are always squawking about how much money is being spent on programs. Here's where we can uh, where conservatives and uh, more liberal legislators and public officials can come together and uh, and and work on on this situation and I, I see my time is just about up uh, uh, and I wanted to see if there's uh, any concluding oh the 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 racial factor in this is uh, is notable. Uh, I mean, the, the African American youth offenders are uh, are, uh, are numerically uh, uh, in in pretty in pretty large numbers, and so it's in this spirit that. Uh, that we we think that we can make some steps forward. Uh, the the Attorney General Eric Holder ought to be, and I am I'm going to try to interest him in this. The uh, U.S. Surgeon General has been very very uh, important in showing that there isn't some predisposition that the the rehabilitation factor is. Is very strong, and so I, uh, I uh, thank everyone for uh, uh, listening to me, and I, I await a further opportunity for discussion with you. I'm pleased and honored to have this opportunity to appear before. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I'm new to this. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm truly honored to have this opportunity to appear before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to address this issue of juvenile sentence to life without parole in the United States of America. I've been a circuit judge for nearly 30 years. I'm now retired. Prior to that, I was an administrator of the courts, a, a uh, federal prosecutor, and before that, an officer of the United States Army. I've been president of the Federal Bar Association, so a number of these issues have come to us as a bar association. I also can second both what Ms. LaBelle and Congressman Conyers have said about the inner city youth. I run a foundation in the inner city and I also have a William Booth Legal Aid Clinic that covers five counties in southeastern Michigan. Our system of jurisprudence has since its conception, until about 40 years ago, had the individual that appeared before the court as an individual, who was addressed by the court as an individual with all those peculiarities, all those experiences, and all that knowledge. And they were addressed as individuals in the sentencing process. We considered many factors, including his or her background, the crime, its severity for which they had been charged, and the defendant's potential for rehabilitation. In determining the sentence, the judge was assisted by both, I'm sorry, thank you, by both prosecution defense counsel, along with input from a trained probationary staff to make an informed judgment of sentence on that individual. This would hopefully allow a sentence that is just, based on both the crime as well as the defendant's relevant factors. Historically, sentencing laws in the 50s and 60s and the punishment practices were predicated on the idea that harsh, mandatory sentences served no valid purpose, that decisions affecting an offender's liberty should be insulated as much as possible from punitive attitudes and that a primary purpose of imprisonment is to try to rehabilitate and get that prisoner back into the community where they can be a contributing citizen. This all changed as we moved through the 70s into the 80s with the prosecutor's waivers, mandatory sentencing, sentencing guidelines, becoming the form of restricting the judge to give that individual attention to the individual defendant before him. Much of the discretion was taken away from the judge where he was able to evaluate the defendant as an individual. Now what we also had, not only the sentencing guidelines and the waiver statute, but we also had the life without parole to juveniles. 
One of these cases came before me approximately 20 years ago. At the time of the crime, Jennifer Pruitt was 16 years of age. She dropped out of school in the sixth grade and was turned into the streets by her parents at the age of 12. She was what we call a street person. One of her friends of the street was a 24-year-old Donnell Miracle, eight years her senior. Donnell told Jennifer that she needed some money and she needed it fast. There was a 75-year-old man, Helmer Hiker, who lived down the street, who would befriended the young people in this neighborhood. Donnell said to Jennifer, we know the old man has money in his house, Let's go down there, and while I'm distracting him, you go find the money that he has stashed away. Jennifer did as she was told, and she found the money, and she returned to the living room where she left Donnell, and now we're talking. She encountered Donnell stabbing him 25 times with a kitchen knife that she had found. Jennifer ran into the bathroom, blocked the door. Some time passed, and Jennifer exited the bathroom and found Donnell asleep and Elmer dead. She ran next door, told the occupants there was a dead man next door. The police were called. The prosecution got a waiver for Jennifer to be tried as an adult on felony murder. The felony being robbery and the killing which occurred during the felony, thus felony murder. Jennifer was found guilty by a jury in my courtroom. In sentencing her as an adult, I had very little discretion. I had no choice but to sentence her to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. In the recent decision of Miller v. Alabama, the majority decision found that these mandatory sentences remove the consideration of youth entirely from the life without parole sentencing equation. More specifically, the court expressly explained that a major man mandatory juvenile life without parole sentence prevents the court, which we once had, from taking into account that individual, their family, the home environment that surrounds the child and from which the child cannot usually extricate themselves, no matter how brutal and dysfunctional the family is. It neglects the circumstances of both the offender and the offense. The problem for Jennifer and other juveniles is that the Supreme Court did not address the retroactivity of their decision. Now let me bring you up to date about Jennifer. She has changed. She has grown up and matured in prison. She was raped in prison and was a primary witness in a class action lawsuit brought against the Michigan Correction System. She finished her schooling, tutors new prisoners in reading and writing. The administration of the prison has, called, prison has called upon her to do suicide watch over her fellow prisoners. She has changed. She has something to give society. She has been rehabilitated. She has history to come and help us all to understand. She should be given the opportunity to live free and become a contributing member of society. I think that if there is any time in our history where this American document can become a reality in all of our states in this country is now. The courts at the local level are moving toward restorative justice with drug courts, veterans courts, mental health courts, wherein they do not look at the penal sanction, but they look at the corrective nature of each individual who comes before them. So we're ready for it. And as another indication of this in the America's brief that we filed in before the United States Supreme Court, uh, correction, before the Michigan Supreme Court just recently, we had the opportunity to engage over 100 judges and former prosecutors, judges who had sentenced juveniles with life without parole, who asked the court, the Michigan court, to consider the retroactivity. They were all encouraged, they were all very enthusiastic about having the opportunity to finally bring this question to fruition. So we have an attitude within our judicial system, within our legal system, and within our society to which this matter can be addressed and brought home once and for all where every individual before our courts can be treated as an individual and we can give them justice and we can give them freedom to be a contributing adult. Thank you very much. Um, with a small indulgence from the United States since they said they would not take their 25 minutes. Um, we have a two-minute video from the youth, if we may play it. If you agreed. <coughs> While we set that up, let me let the chair formally welcome you, Congressman. We're very pleased and honored that you're able to join us, Congressman Conyers.
it is the decision of this court that on the count one, which is the felony murder, to sentence him to life without the possibility of parole. And I do that uh, with a very heavy heart. It took a lot of thought in this court's uh, to come to this conclusion. But after reviewing everything and all the testimony, I am convinced that it is the right thing to do in this particular situation. What makes the loss greater for me? I mean, think about the times from the age you were 16 until the age you were 34. I mean, there's a lot of time in there. That's all, that's your entire youth. You know, that's the times that you're supposed to be out exploring the world or figuring out who you are. Or... You just lose everything. Thank you. Okay, I would now ask the state uh, to give their presentation. Thank you very much, Madam Commissioner, and we'd like to extend a, a welcome to petitioners and all our guests here today. Um, my name is Lawrence Combiner. I am the Deputy Permanent Representative of the United States Mission to the Organization of American States. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm joined at the table by distinguished members of the Department of State, Ms. Sabina Rajpal from our legal office, Ms. Margaret Pickering from our legal office, and Ms. Rachel Owen from the U.S. Mission to the Organization of American States. I would like to begin by reaffirming that the United States takes the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and its role in the OAS very seriously, and we are committed to addressing with you human, human rights issues in the hemisphere including those in the United States. We have worked steadfastly in recent years to increase our engagement with the Commission on important human rights issues facing our country. We have actively participated in the Commission's meetings, hearings, and expert consultations. We are dedicated to this process and make every effort to ensure the appropriate level of participation to provide the Commission with the opportunity to engage with a full array of policymakers and decision makers in the U.S. government. We take pride in the Commission's role in our region, and we are open to engagement and welcome the hearings today on this topic of concern, not only to petitioners, but to NGOs, civil society, and the public. In this particular case, we have been engaging with the Commission for a number of years, and we'll be providing an update this morning. We understand the interest of the Commission in this issue, and have been working to make all resources available to the Commission to undertake a study of juveniles serving life in prison, including assisting the Commission's Rapporteur for Children's Issue with a visit to a number of U.S. prisons to view the overall conditions of juveniles serving sentences in adult prisons. As a matter of fact, the Commission is scheduled to visit U.S. prisons in April, which will include prisons in the state of Michigan. We are pleased to be working with the Commission to finalize these details and assist this visit. We welcome this engagement. We are, uh, have looked forward we, to the presentations today as they have informed us in our continued study of this issue. At this point, I would like to turn it over to Ms. Rajpal from our legal office to discuss the specifics of the petition before us today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am Sabina Rajpal, attorney advisor in the Office of Human Rights uh, at the Office of the Legal Advisor at the State Department. Uh, we just want to reiterate that we support the Commission's work to advance the protection and promotion of human rights, and we thank the petitioners for their presentation. At the outset, I note that integral to our juvenile justice system is an approach that works to protect several goals. First, to protect public safety. Second, to hold offenders accountable for their crimes. 
Third, to provide treatment and rehabilitative services tailored to the needs of juveniles. The petitioners have alleged that several, several rights in the American Declaration have been violated. These include the right to life, liberty, and personal security, the right to equality before the law, the right to protection for children, the right to education, the right to basic civil rights, the right to a fair trial, the right to humane treatment while in custody, and the right to due process of law and the prohibition on cruel, infamous, or unusual treatment and punishment. Before addressing these specific violations, petitioners also assert that the American Declaration generally should be interpreted to prohi prohibit the sentence in question here, which is sentencing juveniles to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. It's important to note at the outset that the American Declaration itself contains no prohibition of the sentence. The petitioners would push the boundaries of the Commission's interpretive mandate to include international treaties um, that they would seek that the Commission use those to prohibit, to interpret the American Declaration. Yet the statute of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights explicitly provides that in relation to non-state parties to the American Convention, such as the United States, that for the purposes of the Commission statute, the human, that human rights are understood to be only the rights set forth in the American Declaration. Respectfully, the Commission is not competent to hear or review matters that are not under the American Declaration and within its jurisdictional purview. The petitioners also assert that the imposition of a life sentence without parole to juveniles violates customary international law, treaties, and other international instruments. The petitioners, to support their claim, cite to treaties to which the United States is not party and that are not binding on the United States, including the American Convention on Human Rights, the European Convention on Human Rights, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which are beyond the scope and authority of the Commission's competence of review because they're outside of the American Declaration. Even the ICCPR to which the United States is party is not directly pertinent to the issues before the Commission as only the rights set forth in the American Declaration act as the legal standard applicable to this case. Therefore, any analysis of the United States compliance with other international instruments is misplaced and beyond the jurisdiction of the Commission. The petitioners also argue that the sentence in question, sentencing juveniles to life imprisonment without parole, violates customary international law. Customary international law is evidenced by state practice that is extensive and virtually uniform and where states act under a sense of legal obligation, which is accepted as law. We do not believe the petitioners have shown that the latter requirement is in place. We also note that a state that persistently objects to a rule of customary international law cannot be bound by it. The commission itself has emphasized this point, stating that, quote, a norm of customary international law binds all states with the exception of only those that have persistently rejected the practice prior to its becoming law. I cite here the Dominguez case. Uh, even in assuming arguendo that there is state practice and a legal obligation on this issue, the state, United States has explicitly and persistently objected to any prohibition of this practice and any suggestion of its status as a rule of customary international law. Therefore, the United States is not bound by any customary international rule prohibiting these types of sentences, if any such rule exists, due to our persistent and recognized objection of the United States to this prohibition. Uh, so the first allegation uh, by the petitioners is that this type of sentence violates Article 7 of the American Declaration. This is the article that uh, provides the right of children to special protection. The petitioners cite to the Dominguez case as stating that the obligation for special protection includes ensuring the well-being of juvenile offenders and endeavoring their rehabilitation. The commission has stated that this provision denotes that children should be viewed as human beings which deserve assistance and care due to their status of minors. This does not mean that juveniles may never be sentenced to the subject, or, sorry, never be subject to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The petitioners also argue that Article 7 creates two additional rights for children in the criminal justice system, namely a right to be incarcerated for the shortest possible duration and a right to rehabilitation and reintegration into society. From this broad interpretation, petitioners assert a violation of these rights. These purported rights are no way established under the American Declaration. 
It is a stretch to say that they have been recognized as fundamental rights under other international or other under international law. The petitioners provide no basis in the text, history, or structure of Article 7 of the American Declaration to support this assertion. Instead, the petitioners draw on other international instruments, including the American Convention, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Yet again, these treaties are outside the purview of the Commission's jurisdiction, and as explained, the United States is not party to the Convention on the Rights of the Child or the American Convention, and therefore has not undertaken any obligations under those treaties. The petitioners have thus created fundamental rights from Article 7, which have no basis. However, I note the United States does, in fact, recognize the right of children to special protection. In the context of juvenile justice specifically, the U.S. Supreme Court has recognized that juveniles' lack of maturity and underdeveloped sense of responsibility, leading to recklessness, impulsivity, and heedless risk-taking, uh, and that juveniles are more vulnerable to negative influences and outside pressures. Furthermore, as the petitioners noted, in 2012, the Supreme Court in Miller versus Alabama prohibited mandatory sentences for juveniles to life imprisonment without parole, uh, allowing now for judges to consider the age of the offender and other mitigating circumstances. In that sense, U.S. case law does provide special protections for juveniles in the criminal justice system, but the right to special protection does not mean that a juvenile may never be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for a homicide offense. We also note that there are many other statutes and, and um, regulatory frameworks in the United States that consider the special status of children in the juvenile, uh, or sorry, in the criminal justice system. For example, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, which uh, had its regulations recently adopted, uh, is aimed at increasing protections for incarcerated juveniles. Uh, the next allegation petitioners make is that their sentences violate Articles 25 and 26 of the Declaration on Humane Treatment in Custody and the Prohibition on Cruel, Infamous, or Unusual Punishment. The United States respects right to life, liberty, and security, and these rights are in no way a prohibition on sentencing of juveniles to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Moreover, the United States Constitution also prohibits cruel and unusual punishment and analogous to the American Declaration. When the United States becomes parties to treaties, it does so with the understanding that the prohibition on cruel or unusual treatment is coextensive with U United States' constitutional prohibitions. Because discretionary sentencing of juveniles to the sentence for homicide-related offenses is still constitutional, it would be improper to interpret the provisions of the American Declaration as establishing protections that exceed those guaranteed by the United States Constitution. The United States is entitled to exercise its law enforcement prerogative to impo impose fair and just sentencing that meets legal standards required for satisfying the U.S. Constitution. I note that in reviewing a sentence for proportionality under the Eighth Amendment, the court applies a case-by-case -case determination that looks at the evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society. The court also looks at whether there is a national consensus against the practice at issue. Again, the Supreme Court has narrowed the instances in which a life sentence without the possibility of parole for a juvenile may be imposed. It has said such sentences for non-homicide offenses is cruel and unusual punishment. It has similarly said mandatory life sentences without parole for juveniles is cruel and unusual punishment. But such sentences for juveniles that are discretionary and for homicide offenses are still constitutional. I also note that these Supreme Court cases have happened since the petitioners filed their petition. Um, the next allegation petitioners assert is that their sentences violate their due process rights under the Declaration. The petitioners' due process rights have, in fact, been recognized by the courts, and they have had ample opportunities to exercise those legal rights through appeals through all court levels. This is evidenced by the long procedural histories of many of these cases, by the petitioners' trials, appeals, and subsequent habeas proceedings. The U.S. criminal justice system gives full effect to the fair trial protections and procedural guarantees contained in the Declaration and have done so in the petitioner's cases. The U.S. Constitution, which applies to both federal and state criminal proceedings, establishes a wide range of rights for individuals charged with criminal offenses, as do other state and federal laws and regulations. The petitioners presented no evidence showing that they were unlawfully prevented from bringing suit in U.S. courts or that they did not receive fair trials. 
The petitioners argue that they were entitled to specific safeguards as juveniles to ensure that they receive fair trials. Their argument rests on Article 14 of the ICCPR, but again, petitioners rely on instruments outside of the American Declaration that are not within the purview of the Commission. The petitioners also allege that the Michigan sentencing scheme violated their due process rights. The petitioners at the time of their conviction were afforded due process protections regarding prosecution, conviction, and sentencing as provided by U.S. law in compliance with the American Declaration. Moreover, we note again that the Miller case has integrated greater procedural safeguards in sentencing of juveniles, requiring the decision maker to take into account the offender's juvenile status and attributes for sentencing and rehabilitation purposes. This Miller, the Miller case shows that petitioners can seek review to their life sentences without parole. Under the Miller holding and the evolving nature of Michigan law, the petitioners may have the chance to have their mandatory life sentence without parole reconsidered. To our knowledge, the petitioners have not attempted uh, any review under Miller. Since Michigan is still divided on whether the Miller case will apply, apply retroactively to all juveniles subject to mandatory sentences of life without the possibility of parole, the petitioners may be entitled to resentencing hearings under U.S. law. Uh, so the next, uh, the petitioners assert that their rights to be free from discrimination under Article 2 have been violated because the sentences have a racially disparate impact. Again, petitioners rely on the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, another instrument outside of the purview of the Commission. Petitioners do not allege specific instances of discrimination in their particular cases. We also note that Attorney General Holder has been very interested in correcting racial disparities in criminal sentencing generally and has undertaken a number of actions in this regard, while not specific to juveniles, but in the overall criminal justice system. Uh, the next assertion is that their sentences, or, or rather that petitioners' right to rehabilitative programs have been violated. The petitioners allege that Articles 1 and uh, 17, interpreted in, in light of Article 7, which is the special protection of, for children, guarantee the petitioners a right to rehabilitation. Again, this is a broad interpretation of the rights that has no basis in the text, history, or structure of Article 7 of the American Declaration. While rehabilitation is an important aspect of justice, especially for juveniles, there is no right to rehabilitation per se. Petitioners argue that the United States needs to have more specialized laws that address when juveniles come into conflict with the law. The United States has such specialized laws. For example, the Prison Rape Elimination Act provides significant protections for youth in juvenile and adult facilities. The Prison Rape Elimination Act regulations prohibit placing juveniles in isolation in order to protect them from harm unless there are no other alternatives and require that juveniles in isolation have access to recreation, visitation, education, and programming. Petitioners also argue that Michigan should take into account the individual status as a child. Michigan has codified the requirement that a child status is taken into account when a juvenile is to be tried as an adult. Michigan law outlines a series of factors to be taken into consideration when determining whether the child should be tried as an adult. Um, next, petitioners allege that the United States is in violation of Article 12. Uh, Article 12 states that the right to education includes the resources that the state or community is in a position to provide. Therefore, for incarcerated juveniles, the state or community may not in all cases be in a position to provide all types of education, including vocational or higher educational opportunities. As petitioners have stated in their brief, at least 14 of the petitioners have obtained their GED, which is equivalent to a high school degree. Additionally, Michigan's policy is for each warden to ensure that each prisoner is, in, is evaluated by education staff upon arrival at his or her, her institution. The educational program plan that they set up identifies education programs and services offered to the prisoner set forth and set forth goals for completion. The policy directive also instructs that educational program plan uh, be reviewed at least quarterly by education staff and updated as necessary. Michigan Department of Corrections also stipulates that special education programs are available to any prisoner ages 21 and under. Moreover, if the prisoner does not have a high school diploma or GED certificate, the prisoner must enroll in prisoner education as soon as possible after arrival. I also note that one of the arguments petitioners make is that many of the, 
the petitioners have been rehabilitated as indicated by the fact that they're you know tutoring other students that they've completed a certain level of education I think this shows that services have been provided to get them to that state um, in some the petitioner sentences themselves are not prohibited by the American Declaration and do not violate the American Declaration I think um, my time is up so I thank you for allowing us to present our observations on this case and we will be filing our written observations later this week thank you uh, thank you. I'm now going to ask the Rapporteur for the United States, Commissioner Gonzalez, to make his contribution. Good morning. Um, I, thanks, uh, I thank the, the presentations uh, done by the petitioners and, and uh, by the state. And um, I would like to make a few uh, reflections and, and some questions. Um, First of all, this is a, a hearing about the merits uh, on the case, so uh, there are a number of issues uh, that were already decided by the Commission in its uh, admissibility report uh, two years ago. I'm not going to refer to those issues uh, on admissibility that have been already settled by the Commission. Um, there is a general uh, observation made by the uh, delegation uh, from the state um, affirming that the, the interpretation of the American uh, Declaration um, shouldn't be um, done in connection with uh, uh, other instruments of international law, especially not with those uh, which uh, have not been ratified by the U.S. Uh, the U.S. government delegation also states that uh, um, provisions of the American uh, Declaration on Human Rights, when similar to those of the, the American Constitution, uh, or quite similar, like the prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment, should be interpreted by the Commission as the domestic uh, authorities uh, do in the United States. Well, um, in this regard, I think that uh, uh, should the Commission proceed in that manner, it would seriously impair its, uh, impair its, uh, its role and uh, it's got, it, it would go against uh, what uh, it has been uh, its practice for many decades. Uh, not only regarding the United States, but all countries in the Americas. In fact, there are a number of uh, countries in Latin America which uh, had, and some of them still have, uh, provisions that uh, apparently are similar to those in the American Declaration or in the American Convention, but in fact they are applied by local judges in many countries of Latin America in a manner that the Commission considers inconsistent with the American Declaration. And that, is, has, been a, that has been an approach uh, by the Commission that has been supported by the United States concerning other countries of the Americas. So it's not a matter only of the Commission, but every international uh, human rights body will uh, interpret the, the provisions of the instruments of the respective system according to international law and not necessarily according to domestic legislation or domestic interpretation. Otherwise, the, the role of the international body would be seriously limited. So that's a point that is relevant to make. And the fact that the U.S. Supreme Court itself recognizes that there is an issue of uh, cruel and unusual punishment in uh, juvenile parole uh, without the possibility of uh, juvenile uh, imprisonment without the, the possibility of parole uh, at all, it's a matter uh, relevant for the Commission to uh, consider. Now, um, <clears throat> I would like to make a question, one question to the to the petitioners and I want to the government. To the petitioners, I would like them uh, to elaborate more uh, on the issue of uh, the, uh, the racial, racial discrimination they alleged uh, as to apply to alleged victims. And to the government, I would like to ask, in order to have a, a more clear picture and in order to uh, make the adequate interpretation, what is the, the rationale for life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for, ju for, uh, for juveniles? What is the rationale behind this? 
It is important for the Commission to understand this so as to analyze this issue from a human rights uh, point of view. The American Declaration, as the American, as the U.S. Constitution, uh, or as the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which uh, uh, has also been supported by the United States, uh, are uh, instruments that uh, have uh, broad uh, regulations, and it's very relevant to consider what's the uh, specific uh, rationale behind the norms uh, to make decisions based on these instruments. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to endorse what uh, my colleague, Commissioner Gonzalez, said about, in particular, jurisdiction, and, and I agree with his other comments as well. So I just wanted to make a, a couple more general um, points. And one has to do with what Congressman spoke about, about the matter being unknown. Um, in the U.S., citizens are unaware of this issue. And I just wanted to remind us all that the commission is not only about hearing cases and deciding cases, but the commission has a very important role um, in terms of its promotional activity, if you want to call it public education. So I do think, um, uh, since that's part of our mandate, that this is very important for us to be involved in this, and hopefully we can assist you in that. So that was one that I wanted to say. I think in terms of, of this particular issue, it's clear that the United States is out of sync um, with the rest of the world. And whereas we, we of course, we agree uh, a state's prerogative to have sentencing and so on, um, I think for the United States as a country that is so committed to democratic process and to human rights, this issue really casts a long shadow on its very proud human rights record. And that's regardless of the technical arguments that we have heard. And the fact that the, the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court has already ruled on this issue, to me is indicative of at least some general acceptance of, 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 of these international norms that we are discussing today. So for me, it's really an invitation for the United States to rethink its policy in, uh, on this, in this area. We at the Commission did note the Miller case, and we embraced it enthusiastically when it came. And it's very disheartening to learn that it hasn't filtered down quite in the way that we had expected, because it was very enlightened jurisprudence from our point of view, very much in line with international norms and so on. And clearly, we at the Commission are very committed to this principle of special status of juveniles, both in their treatment in the justice system and also in this, this sentencing in a more particular way. Um, as regards the race issue, I have special concern for that because I am also the rapporteur for the rights of persons of African, um, of African descent. And this is an issue that has really troubled us greatly in general, the sentencing sy judicial system in the United States and elsewhere, um, and the disproportionate impact of certain sentences um, on persons of African descent. And one of the things we have asked uh, for more serious studies and more particular statistics, and I think that's relevant for this case, because we need to be able to establish what we call context, and uh, we don't have enough statistics, whether it's to do with juveniles who are African descent or just generally um, persons of African descent in the system, for us to make the kind of analogy that we've done very successfully, for instance, with gender that we're able to, to, to lay a claim of disproportionate impact, and then that is grounds for talking about um, uh, the issue of racial discrimination. So I would like to urge that we, we, we make a concerted effort to do this, and this is on both sides. This is not just for petitioners. Um, but generally, I would say that this issue, quite apart uh, from everything else, is one of moral responsibility. And so I would hope that the arguments as we go forward, it would not just be based on merely legalistic arguments, but that the Commission can work with the United States, both the state and petitioners, to really bring about meaningful change. Thank you. Um, how much time we have? We've yes. Um, I'm now going to ask um, our Assistant Executive Secretary, Deputy Executive Secretary, um, Elizabeth Abbey Merchad, who has joined us to ask a question. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, 
I just had two quick points uh, to ask for further clarification at this stage of the merits. First, given the different domestic rulings that have been mentioned today uh, that establish that mandatory life sentences without the possibility of parole would imply a violation of the right to, cruel, to be free of cruel and unusual punishment under the Constitution, um, it's important for the Commission to be able to understand how that recent jurisprudence um, relates to the situation of the presumed victims in the particular case who continue to serve that sentence. And as a substantive matter, what would be the remedy that the presumed victims could invoke to obtain a resentencing hearing? And how is that possibility being made available to them? So I'm not asking as a question of exhaustion of domestic remedies, because we're already in the merit stage, but as a question of access to uh, substantive protection that the government has referred to today in its allegations. And the second point that I wanted to bring up is that another allegation that the petitioners have made and that the Commission has taken into account in its decision on admissibility has to do with access to uh, public defense services, whether the presumed victims in this case had adequate access to public defender services. And I think another question that the Commission would want to look at is whether the U.S. Um, public defender service takes into account the specific situation of persons under 18 who are being charged with serious crimes and whether the public defender services um, include any specialized um, focus dealing with the situation of uh, persons under 18. Thank you. Okay. Um, I am going to give both parties three minutes to respond. It's not a long time, but I think it's sufficient because, of course, we always welcome written observations. It will eat into our break time, but given the importance of this subject, I think we can take a short break rather than a long break for the next one. So three minutes. Thank you. If I may respond to the inquiry regarding the racial disparities. Um, I would note that there are two amicus briefs filed, one by the NAACP LDF and one by Human Rights Watch, both which provide certain data um, that has been collected by NGOs, although um, we would note that the federal government, to our knowledge, has not collected any of this data or required it, nor has the state of Michigan. There are two really important points that are raised in those briefs that I'll just say briefly. One, the underpinnings of the sentence itself. In, in Michigan and nationally, there was a whole groundswell that was focused on youth of color being um, a, a morally corrupt group. And in fact, particularly mentioned Congressman Conyers' district, Wayne County, of youth of color who could were naturally predisposed um, to violence, rape, and murder. And these were quotations in the brief from Michigan officials in which there was no hope of rehabilitation. So that began a whole slide of beginning at 14 years old of putting kids who were of color in prison for the rest of their lives without any um, you know, thoughtfulness um, other than a belief in this sort of morally corrupt youth. The result in Michigan and nationally, as Human Rights Watch says, that um, black youth, for example, are, are serving the sentence as a rate more than 17 times for white youth. And it is not a matter of who commits it and who does not. Because in Michigan, we have shown in many counties, for example, 100% of the youth um, serving life without parole are kids of color, Latino and um, uh, African American, while only 60% of the youth who committed crimes in that county were kids of color. So the, the decision of the prosecutor as to who gets charged and who gets a sentence, which youth have attorneys that can help them negotiate plea deals to much lower sentences are all racially um, infected in, in this sentence. Um, and um, we would note to those, those matters with re it, that are in the amicus brief for further data and details that support this. 
Um, secondly, it, with regard to the retroactivity issue, um, Michigan youth are simply not able um, to um, seek this because the state court has ruled that Miller is not retroactive. So despite petitions filed by many of the petitioners, including Henry Hill, um, they have been rejected by the state court saying Miller is not retroactive. You have no right to a rehearing. I would note that there is a case in the federal courts in the Sixth Circuit which again, the, the Department of Justice has not seen fit to join in on or to weigh in in any amicus fashion in any of these matters that seeks to declare um, <laughs> that this is unconstitutional in Michigan to hold, post Miller to hold people in this situation for life without possibility of parole. Um, but they have no opportunity at this time, as do 39 states, youth who are sitting in 39 states. Um, who are for which it's not declared retroactive. And again, we would note that there's a continuation of this sentence. I would finally note that in addition to the life without parole, there are many states that without any consideration of the child's status as required by Miller, are getting sentences um, which we call basketball sentence, 80, 90, 100 years. In Michigan, the sentence that's permissible is 40 years to 90 years for a child. And because they're not facing life without possibility of parole, the courts and the legislature have said you have no obligation to consider their child status because Miller only requires that in circumstances where they face the possibility of life without parole. So these um, de facto life sentences have not been addressed in any way. And we don't even know the number of youth serving the sentence, which I think indicates a total disrespect in it lack of concern for what's happening to children in this country in the criminal justice system. Steve? Okay. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. I, I would like to clarify a few points that the commissioners raised. Um, first, with regard to other international instruments, we would assert that for treaties that we have not ratified, we are not bound by those obligations. I think that um, is not too controversial. But on other in instruments being relevant for the commission, it's not that they're not relevant. It's Our point is more that the commission cannot find violations of obligations from other instruments that are not contained in the American Declaration. Um, the other point I want to clarify is that uh, the point about cruel and uh, unusual treatment under our Constitution and the commission's competency to look at it. Of course, the commission can look to see if uh, state practice deviates from the American Declaration, regardless of what legal provisions are in place in that state. But we were trying to make the point that we comply with the Declaration through our Constitution, through a similar prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. And while the Declaration itself is not binding in state and federal courts, the Constitution is, and our constitutional jurisprudence in this area would be of interest to the commission. So I want to clarify those two points. Um, I think we also received a question about the rationale behind these sentences. And for some of the questions asked, I, we will supplement in our written materials as well. Um, you know, I would note that, of course, many states have, as we've heard, have um, these sentences for juveniles. Of course, now they're discretionary going forward. Um, and I believe, you know, many democratically elected legislators took on these you know, adopted these sentences with a concern for the level of crime in their communities. Um, and I, you know, in certain cases, I think they thought that in some cases it would be appropriate for juveniles to receive the sentence depending on the severity of the crime, uh, particularly if, if being released posed some risk to the community. Um, we can, you know, look into the different factors that have been taken into account in adopting these sentences. We note that we have the sentence federally as well, although the federal government has taken the position that the Miller case applies retroactively to federal um, juveniles, juveniles who are serving in the federal system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this has been a very important and wide-reaching uh, hearing, and I would like to thank uh, both parties, all of the petitioners and the state for coming here. And it is important that you are here um, and that you are engaging on the issue. We do appreciate that. And um, I think we, we have a couple other hearings. We're going to just have a few minutes, but thank you all so much for this hearing, and we move. hopefully we can move forward in a meaningful way on this issue. Good day. Thank you.